Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. It's a pleasure and an honor to be in such a gorgeous city as Granada to talk about this work. So this is work done in collaboration with two, uh, two other PhD students in the group, Kelly Wirtz and Jose Paulo Gomez, who you already met, as well as my supervisor, Eduardo Martin Martinez. So the big picture motivation of this project is to approach this notion of entanglement and quantum field theory. Now, Entanglement is this notion of a correlation between subsystems that goes beyond anything that can be described classically. And it plays a variety of different roles in theoretical physics. For, from the bigger picture, it is in quantum information, for example, an important resource for several uh, enhancements on classical computing protocols. In condensed matter, it can be used to characterize quantum, phase, quantum phases of matter and exotic phases of matter. Uh, more importantly to us, since this is a QFT in Curve Space Times workshop, in quantum gravity as well, it's connected to some things like the emergence of a classical geometry from quantum degrees of freedom in ways that are made the most precise, perhaps, in things like the ads cft correspondence. So overall, I think it's fair to say that entanglement is central to understanding of various foundational aspects of quantum field theory and how it relates to geometry and quantum information. However, uh, it is also true that entanglement is tricky and hard to characterize quantitatively in QFT. And like the most naive reason for that is because if you try to do like the first thing you would do to describe entanglement, let's say between two complementary regions of space, you will imagine something like a tensor factorization of the global hyperspace. You take some pure states of this global hyperspace, you trace out a subsystem and you take things like the phenomenon entropy of each subsystem that would quantify the entanglement entropy between A and A bar. And that is infinite for any regular state of a QFT due to UV divergences. Essentially, there are, there's entanglement between arbitrarily short distances uh, between the entangling surface that separates A and its complement. Now, there are, once you're faced with that problem, there are basically uh, two things or two big directions you could pursue. The first is to embrace the fact that subregions of a QFT are a type three phenomenon algebra, and you talk about things that are well defined in that sense. So no more tensor products, no more partial traces, but still things that quantify entanglement in that setting. We're not going to do that. There have been several like new advances in understanding quantum field theory and entanglement through that approach recently. But what we're going to do is something a little bit simpler, let's say, which is to impose something like a regularization to the theory that renders the divergences finite which would be sort of the naive, you could say, approach from a physicist's point of view. But also, we would argue that there are operationally good reasons to go with this approach because, well, if you think about particle detector models, which I'm lucky enough to have had both Thales and Jose talk about it before I did, uh, you could imagine a task of extracting entanglement from the field by coupling a set of probes to it and those probes will usually come with characteristic finite length scales and energy gaps, which pro not provide a natural cutoff. And also due to those same like regularization schemes that are derived from the detector side, uh, they can at most extract a finite amount of entanglement. So that's UV divergent entanglement in between subregions in quantum field theory will not be visible in practice by any operational procedure that, that you could in practice apply. So the goal of the talk, uh, there are a few goals. Is to, the first is basically to show how to set the coupling between field and particle detectors, such that the probes best capture entanglement features of the quantum field. In particular, we will show how to couple the probes to a given region, such that the entanglement that the, the probes acquire best reflects the entanglement originally in the field between the coupling region and its complement. And overall, I see I wanted to take this as a first step towards an approach to entanglement between subregions in QFT that is motivated by operational considerations using particle detectors. So yeah, how do we couple a probe to a quantum field? This is something that you're already familiar with, thanks to the previous talks. Essentially, the idea is that this probe or a particle detector is a localized system that couples to a quantum field in a finite region of space-time in a controllable fashion. And schematically, the form of the interaction looks like this, right? So you can imagine a set of probes that are summing over in this Hamiltonian interaction. You have a coupling constant that's just for bookkeeping purposes and things like that, some expansions, let's say. 
you have the space times mirroring, which controls the region where the, the detector is probably probing the field. You have a probe operator that creates transitions between the eigenstates of the, the detector, uh, according to its free Hamiltonian, and you have a field operator that you're probing. So this schematically is the thing that we've been seeing uh, this morning, right? You can imagine that this each I labels one particular detector, and I'm omitting any Lorentz indices that could be contracted between mu and O, but this is exactly what you've, been, you've seen before, right? The setup for the field that we'll take uh, in order for the technical thing, the things that I've about to say to work is that we'll take the field to be a real scalar field, right? So a quadratic uh, real scalar field in a possibly curved space times. It could have added no minimal coupling here. It wouldn't matter for the things that I'm about to say. And I'm going to take the field to be the vacuum, which for our purposes can be any pure Gaussian state uh, of the field theory, right? That, that, that's the only important thing that I'm, that I'm going to use is the fact that this is a pure Gaussian state. And therefore, it's determined entirely by the two point functions of the field. Now, because of those considerations that I mentioned, I, I think it's well motivated to consider that since the probes always, always come with a, something like a finite resolution, we can imagine approximating the field at any given time by a lattice of harmonic oscillators. So, technically, I'm always like the claims that I'm about to make are rigorously true in discrete, in discrete descriptions of quantum field theory. So I'm replacing this operator value distribution, let's say, in space-time, there's a field, by a set of quadrature operators. So if the field was defined in space-time, I take a slice, I define canonical position and momentum on this slice, and those are phase-space variables for now this lattice of harmonic oscillators. I'm going to replace the canonical commutation relations between field and canonical momentum to things like canonical commutation relations between finite numbers of phase-space variables that I'm encoding here in this symplectic matrix just for compactness. And the information that was encoded in the two-point function is now reorganized in this thing that I call the covariance matrix, which is like the two-point function. More precisely, it's like the Hadamard parts, so the state-dependent parts of the two-point function, as well as time derivatives to get correlations between momentum and, and position. So yeah. So essentially, what we're doing is we're replacing this continuum with a discrete lattice of harmonic oscillators motivated by these considerations of cutoffs from the probes and so on. Now, each pair of canonically conjugated observables, Q and P, define what we're going to call a mode, right? So the field is described by a set of modes. And when we talk about subsystems, they're going to be, they're going to consist of splits of this N mode Gaussian states into little n little n plus m modes, so that the covariance matrix is split in, schematically in things like this form. And it's very easy to identify the covariance matrix of each subsystem if you organize the, the variables in this way, because this is just subsystem A, and this is just subsystem B. So partial traces are very easy to identify. And measures of mixedness and entanglement for these Gaussian states are fully characterized by the covariance matrix, again, uh, because you're looking at a Gaussian state, so everything is defined in terms of the two-point function. In particular, measures of mixing and, and entanglements are particularly conveniently expressed in terms of this. And to do that, like schematically, would be to remember that for any covariance matrix, you can find a change of basis on phase space, so a symplectic transformation on those phase space variables, such that the covariance matrix takes this diagonal decoupled form. We call the basis where this happens, the basis of normal modes in our paper. Uh, some people find this controversial, so just clarifying that this is an, the Williamson modes, because this, the fact that this is true for any covariance matrix is the Williamson theorem. And these numbers are the symplectic eigenvalues of the covariance matrix. In particular, just, just for illustration, the von Neumann entropy of a Gaussian state is fully determined by the symplectic eigenvalues by a closed form expression that you can work out. For subsystems in an overall pure state, the phenomenon entropy of, subs of subsystem A is a genuine measure of entanglement. So there's that. For mixed states, it is customary, and we're going to like we approach this using the logarithmic negativity, which is defined as the log of the trace norm or the one norm of the partial transpose with respect to subsystem B of the original states. For Gaussian states, this reduces to uh, a nice expression 
that again only depends on the symplectic eigenvalues this time of the covariance matrix version of partial of partial transpose which is to invert the momenta of one of the subsystems now with all of that i'm ready to state the main results that i want you guys to take away from this talk which is the following consider a subregion a of a globally pure gaussian state right so imagine you have a and this complements a bar. And the statement is that for any integer n, counting the number of modes that you have access to, the set of modes that is most entangled, most entangled with the complement of A is given by the first n normal modes, counting here in terms of the highest symplectic eigenvalue to lowest, uh, of the covariance matrix of subsystem A. And this establishes what modes we should aim to couple to in order to best extract the entanglement with the complement, complement of the region A that you're originally coupling to. So now I could imagine being more concrete about what kinds of probes you're considering, a uh, setup where you also couple a set of harmonic oscillators to the field. So standard harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian with canonical commutation relations for harmonic oscillators again. And you could engineer, let's say, the coupling, so the Hamiltonian interaction between the coupling a bit between the probe and the field by something like that, right? So if this is a Hamiltonian that comes with a delta coupling, so it instantaneously couples the detector to, to the field at an instant of time. And if you ex exponentiate that, you find that this is how it acts on the phase space variables of the detector and the field. So essentially it swaps the phase spaces between Qs and Ps. So whatever this mode big Q and big P was entangled with is now gonna be entangled with the probe. And this way, we guarantee that the probe has extracted as much entanglement with the complement of its coupling region as it possibly can if you do this choosing these Qs and Ps to be the first normal modes of the subregion, right? So now, to be a bit more concrete, we can illustrate this in, in flat space times. So in flat space times, things can be made a little more explicit. So. So you can imagine taking inertial probes in Minkowski to, to make our lives easier. The field is again going to be a real pre-scalar field that we're all familiar with. The probes are gonna be simple harmonic oscillators again. This time you can perform a discretization, let's say rather explicitly, you just basically replace a bunch of sums, or a bunch of integrals by discrete sums. You replace uh, direct deltas by Kronecker deltas, you rescale uh, phase space variables to make them dimensionless with the characteristic scale coming from the cutoff. And then you can find the ground states and its covariance matrix. And because the Hamiltonian does not couple positions and momenta, the quadratures or the Qs and Ps for the normal modes turn out to only depend on the local Qs and Ps of the field, so they don't mix between themselves. And the Hamiltonian that generates the Gaussian swap between any given mode of the field and the detector will look like this. And you can identify these Gs and Fs that are over here as like the discrete version of position and momentum smearing functions. Right? Now, to illustrate this a bit further, we can look at the spatial profile of the most mixed normal modes, let's say. And it turns out, unsurprisingly perhaps, that the most mixed normal mode is strongly supported near the boundary of the regions. Again, this should not come as a surprise. After all, the interaction comes from nearest neighbor coupling, right? So for the most mixed normal mode of a given region A that I'm gonna illustrate in red, and it's complements A bar in blue, this is the kind of shape that we're gonna look at. So we see that it's most strongly supported near the boundaries. Here's the, here's the result in Two dimensions again, and in three dimensions, the same, the same, the same behavior happens. Here I'm representing this. Each slice here is a 2D slice of of this 3D region in the in the upper cap and in the lower cap here. So yeah, this is a general trend that you're gonna that you're gonna find. So this is pretty much what I had to say for now. The conclusions are that entanglement can be very usefully characterized in, in quantum fields, at least in Gaussian states, by normal modes of subregions. And that the prescription that we found 
uh, gives us the optimal form of coupling that the probes in a given region must implement in order to capture most of the entanglement with the region's complements as faithfully as you possibly can. And a non-exhaustive list of things to think about after doing this could include generalizing this approach to non-complementary regions, which is work in progress. If you want to hear more about this, ask Kelly also. She's in the background, but she'll be around. Uh, we can think about adapting this to smooth switch switchings. Maybe there's something to be said about things like the time-like tube theorem in algebraic quantum field theory using this kind of approach. And it's natural to apply this also to curve space time. I mean, the setup is pretty much the same. Maybe there are subtleties related to the choice of states and cutoffs and, and things like that. But there's no reason why this shouldn't be applicable to that case. So this is pretty much what I had. Thank you all for listening. And I'll be happy to take questions. Now. We've got a question there. Thank you very much. Could you say more about this notion of region you are using and how this notion of a region is related to this choice of a finite number of modes that you are using? So there, these are two, in principle, different notions. The notion of region has to do with the typical size of this mirroring, let's say, of the detector. And the finiteness of the number of modes comes from a UV cutoff that you could add on top of that. So you would be probing. A certain, you can think of it in two ways. You can think of it as something like an array of detectors that spans over a given region. That's the region that you, you can probe, right? And the minimum resolution that each detector can attain will give you the UV cutoff. And that will essentially give you the effectively finite number of, of modes that you can prove. Does that answer your question? Well, that's right. Right. Yeah. Okay, we can got, talk about that more later. But yeah. We've got enough quick questions if you don't mind. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, maybe I missed this information, but uh, each harmonic oscillator is associated to a a local region of the space time or uh, on a particular mode? So each harmonic oscillator is a mode, right? It's a mode of the field which lives in a certain region of space time, right? But yeah, you, you should think of it as a. Uh, yeah, not on a mode intended as a momentum, for example. No, it is a momentum. It's, it's a pair, the, the canonically conjugate pair of Qs and Ps, so, so one position and one, one momentum is what defines the mode, right? And the modes that are relevant to the things that I've just said are naturally associated to localized regions where the detector can, can couple to. Yeah, so but in that case, uh, if I consider, for example, an harmonic oscillator uh, detector with a particular uh, mode, with a particular momentum, let's say, right. um, with a particular frequency, yeah. Right. In that case, uh, you cannot use uh, that uh, swap coupling to induce to the field uh, uh, only a certain uh, momentum. Well, in principle, you could because you would swap the initial state of the probe with that mode of the field. Yeah, and that could be. I mean, okay. We let didn't me, talk about. Yeah. Let, let me cut this. So, uh, yeah. in principle, we could, and uh, the bat is going to the coffee if you don't mind, because otherwise we are not going to have any coffee, and I think we <laughs> deserve one after this this session. So we reconvene before we say thank you.